such a cool scripture, you know. It's, um, it's found, actually, I'll, have it, I'll, I'll read it properly, shall I? I haven't given it to our guys, so they'll be like, oh, goodness, Bib, what are you doing? And welcome if you're watching online as well. Just give me a moment, please. Okay, but you all know it so well, but I just want to show you a little part of it that you may not um, uh, pick up on all the time. And Jesus spoke to them saying, come on, this is what we always call the Great Commission. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of your neighbor, of the nations, of the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Wow. Wow. We can make a difference to our nation because God said so. And if he told us to do something, then it must be doable. Do you think? I think so anyway. Anyway, Peter's been talking a lot about um, faith that endures. So I kind of figured that the thing that follows on from faith is hope. And we often hope for stuff, and we hope for it for ourselves. You know, we hope to get a better job. We hope to find a better wife. Um, (laughs) Oh, seriously. When I was writing this, I was thinking about myself, right? And I thought, you know, we all have struggles in our world. You know, yeah, yeah. no, you don't. Okay, you, you people are perfect. Um, <laughs> as Christ is perfect. Uh, I'm just not quite there yet. And I remember, um, not, a, not I remember, I made a choice many, many, many decades ago. You know, we were, we were struggling. And I thought to myself, I've got to do something about getting from here to there. I can't just hope that my marriage would get better. You know, I couldn't just hope that it would. I couldn't hope that he would change. Oh, he would (laughs) bit. I have this little saying that I'm never going to get married again if anything happened to him because it's just too hard to train another one. (laughs) Seriously. You know. But most guys, they can't go without a housekeeper, let's face it. (laughs) So, anyway... And it was, it was like the reality was is, is that if I wanted to get from here to there, I had to do something about me. You know, <laughs> Nicole asked me recently, you know, what, what was one of those key things? I said, probably the key thing and the hardest thing was for me to learn to shut up. <laughs> really, I had an opinion about everything. And would I let it go? Oh, dear. So I had to learn you know, some things that I needed to lift my game on. What could I do to make my future better instead of hoping that it would get better without me doing anything? Seriously, you know, I digress a little, but basically this is part of the theme of this morning, is where's your hope? And what are you hoping for? And are you hoping just for something for yourself? Or Or is your hope bigger than that? Is it for the nation's? You know, do we hope that things will change in New Zealand or will we actually do something to make those changes? You know, we hope that our school systems will get better, but are we doing something to make that actually come about? So I I love the Word of God. It's so clear and it is so promising, but the promise comes with an oath that if God says it, it's going to happen. And there's things that we sang about this morning if God said it, it's going to happen. We believe things. We believe that Christ will return. We believe that our Savior has saved our soul. We believe so many things. But what about our hope? Is it just something that is hot air? Is it an imagination? It is something that is selfish? Or is it actually based in the Word of God? Because when our hope is based in the Word of God, we have got something that is substantial that we can hang on to that's not going to shift because God said it's not going to shift because it's His Word, and it's there. I remember Pastor Rob teaching us this really cool scripture, and it's found in Hebrews 6 verse 19. This hope we have as an anchor 
of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters in the veil. And I'm looking at that verse and I'm thinking, wow, it is rich. It is rich. Book of Hebrews, book of Romans. Every time you read a scripture, there's like three sermons in one verse. I mean, it's just so profound. But I love this one. It's a hope that is an anchor. And Pastor Rob taught us about an anchor. That's something that you stick in the sand or in a rock or in the ground, and it's there for you to hang on to. And you, even though times and seasons and winds come, you've still got a direct line to that hope. Now, my hope is for things that are beyond the horizon. The horizon is what I can see, but there's stuff that I can't see, but yet I see it in my spirit. I see it in, in, in the word of God. I see it in things that are unfolding. I have a hope that goes beyond where I am today to where I am going for tomorrow. And because I've got a hope that's anchored, I, even though the winds may come, I've still got a line that's attached to me to what's beyond what I can see over the horizon. I have a hope. And the really cool thing I like about this scripture is it says that it enters, it's sure, it's steadfast, and it enters within the veil. I don't know if you realize it, but inside the veil is the Holy of Holies. And when Solomon built his te the temple, I shouldn't say his temple, when Solomon built the temple to God, right, before that, he was worshiping in Moses' tabernacle at Gibeon. The Ark of the Covenant was not there. So he would go and he would bring his sacrifices, but that's as far as it went. So he would come to the tabernacle of Moses, offer his sacrifices, abundant sacrifices, but that's as far as the relationship went. It wasn't until he built Solomon's temple that he actually brought back David's tabernacle, placed it in Solomon's temple, and then there was something that transpired that was so life-changing, world-changing, and that's the presence of, the God, of God fell so strongly in a cloud that the ministers, the priests, couldn't even stand up to minister. They were all on their faces before the Lord. So a shift had taken place from where you're giving something to where God comes and occupies and overtakes whoever you are and whatever you're doing, regardless of the position that you held within that temple. And that happened at Tabernacles. See, I have a hope. I have a hope that is beyond the veil, that something is going to happen. And it may be in the season of Tabernacles. That's where my hope is, because Tabernacles has yet to be fulfilled. We've seen Passover. We've seen Pentecost. Now, tabernacles is yet to be fulfilled. I have a hope that takes me beyond the horizon that I can see at the moment, but I know it exists because God said so. I know it exists because there's patterns in the Bible for us to follow. And then here we have in the New Testament saying, my hope enters beyond within the veil. The veil is the other side of that holy place. I am looking forward to a day where we step beyond our sacrifices and we come into a place of completely being overwhelmed with the presence of God and encompassing of him. I find it so amazing when I stand down the front here in worship and just how God speaks and how his presence just comes and dwells with us. But there's got to be more, church. There's got to be more. Anyway, I'm digressing a little, but not really, because that's where my hope is. And I think sometimes as Christians, we've got all these little clouds around our head, you know. Hope, faith, endurance, prosperity, prayer, salvation, healing. And it's like, God, but can we bring it all into one place? Because sometimes we feel like we're fragmented, but yet God wants to consolidate it because all of those things are found in him. Peter was talking about faith that endures, but I want to talk about a hope that is sure, that it is something that goes beyond where I am today, and it takes me over 
that hill. There's some things that I see that's the hope that is my anchor, but there's some things that I expect as well. There's an expectation within my spirit that some good things are going to happen, that I'm not going to be overwhelmed with the present condition of things, that the church is going to get stronger and the kingdom will be established. I am a kingdom person. I really, really am. And I see the kingdom not just as a celestial body, dare I use that word, I see it as as a governance after the order of Melchizedek. I see it as something that has authority that shifts and changes and changes laws and makes laws. And that's God. You know, he, his governance. So there's got to be something, some substance to, substance to what I see over the horizon. Because hope is not idle. Hope will take me to what I see if what I see has got the substance that is found in the word of God. Can I throw out a couple of those things that I see that are over the horizon? Is that all right? This is what I see. I see a promise of his plans and his purposes, and I also see that God does not lie. So therefore, what he says will come to pass. And again, that's found in the book of Hebrews. God is not a man that he should lie. So the stuff that I, the vision that I have, Probably one of the greatest things is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit like we've never seen before. Not just in my personal, meeting my personal needs. See, we love the Holy Spirit because he heals us, he speaks to us, we speak in tongues, we commune with God, our prayers are heard, we enter into worship, the Holy Spirit reveals things. He's part of, of our conscience. He tells us what's right. He tells us what's wrong. He gives us guidance. And there's this personal relationship with the Holy Spirit that I have and that you have too. Everyone who's been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have that personal relationship. Whether you utilize the power of it or not is your choice because God doesn't override your choice and nobody else will, neither the Holy Spirit. So we have this. But if Jesus Christ came and changed eternity for you and me, what power of the Holy Spirit will be manifest to change all of mankind and nations? There's got to be more than what the Holy Spirit is doing for me personally. There has to be something where the Holy Spirit becomes that dynamic kingdom force nationally and internationally. See, what we do on Community Day with our boxes is here. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he's here. And so then heaven and earth will come together and we'll see the enemy displaced. See, the enemy is the prince of the air. So when we have this, the church, we have this, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, the enemy has to leave. He's gone. The prince of the air has been eradicated. Wouldn't that be so cool? And we have scriptures. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. God said it. Therefore, it has to come to pass. So I see an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is just dynamic, that is undeniable, that is everywhere that we go, we will carry his presence, his governance. We come into church and we step into it. But what about us carrying it out everywhere that we go and not just what's in the house? on a Sunday morning. I see a manifestation of the Holy Spirit like has never been seen before. Never been seen before. Absolutely. Another thing that I see is a fulfillment of Hebrews 6, 1 to 3. And most of us know this because we learn it in, uh, in, our, in what's it called? Gateway. Um, Hebrews 6, 1 to 3, therefore, leaving elementary teaching of Christ, let us press on to maturity. In other words, I want to see the church grow up. That's in my heart that I see, I have a vision for that, for a mature church, for a mature church. 
And look at the power. Not laying again basic stuff like foundation of repentance from dead works. In other words, stop sinning, just get on with it. You've turned away from it, now stay turned. <laughs> Don't turn back, you know. Make one decision. I ain't doing that no more. You know, I'm not thinking like that anymore. I'm not going there anymore. I'm not listening to that anymore. I'm not clicking on that anymore. Amen. Make one decision. Repentance from dead works and faith towards God because he's got something better for me and better for you because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And instructions about washings, it says. What are your washings? Water baptism and baptism of the Holy Spirit because the word baptism is washing. And that is plural, washings, plural. So we've got our washings. Let's keep going. Laying on of hands. Laying on of hands is the setting aside and the anointing of ministry. Just like they did when they anointed the priests. Just like the king was an anointed. And we see that happening today with the arise of apostles and prophets. who we, we've, we've had churches and we've lived in church for so long. But now we're seeing an arising of a voice that's got a governmental authority that it's speaking to us as an individual, but it's also speaking to nations and is speaking to the heavenly realms as well. You know, it's prophetic and it's strong and it has an authority that comes from God. Laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead and eternal judgments. Now, a lot of traditional teaching breaks this verse in half, but it's not broken in half. It is also part of a, fund, a foundational experience for every believer. See, resurrection of the dead and eternal judgments. Now, of course the dead are going to be raised and judged and everything like that. But that's not what it's speaking about in this context. This context is resurrection of the dead, like Lazarus. Like Lazarus. Resurrection of the dead. Resurrection of the dead. Eternal judgments, like Ananias and Sapphira. Who are they? Well, they drop dead because they lied to the Holy Spirit. So there is a ministry or experience that we've yet to see as a church, a body of believers, that is part of the kingdom of God. It's incredible what God has for us. Does it exist? Yes. Are we seeing it today? No. Does it exist beyond the horizon? Yes. Are my eyes firmly fixed on the vision what's ahead? Oh, you better believe it. You better believe it. Not laying again these foundations of resurrection of the dead and eternal judgments. And then check out verse 3. And this we will do if God permits. So there is something yet for us to be, to do, and to experience. I also believe that there's something special about New Zealand. That we're called God's own. That's been our nickname for two and a half centuries or whatever it is. That is our nickname, God's own. But God's constantly, we see in the word of God, a, excuse me, a reference to the ends of the earth. And we're the ends of the earth. We're the furthest most part from Jerusalem. We all know that geographically. How further can you get from Jerusalem? Not much. So we're it. And so I believe that there's something special about New Zealand. Isaiah 45, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. That's the word of God. Isaiah 55, so will my word by which goes forth from my mouth, it will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter in which it was sent. See, God's word goes out, turn to him and be saved ends of the earth. I believe that there's something special about New Zealand because once his word goes around the world, from this point, it's going to make a switch and start to begin to return towards the center of God's kingdom. Well, it's all God's. Back towards where the word came from with power, with authority. Why shouldn't it happen here? Why shouldn't we be the ones who step in beyond the veil? Why shouldn't we be the ones with resurrection of the dead and eternal judgments ministry? Why shouldn't we be? We're as far away as you can get. 
So let's see a switch take place because the word of God says it is doable. I got a vision for that. I got a vision for the manifestation of the sons of God. I love this one. This one's so cool. Romans 8. For the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself, I know this is wordy, itself also will be set free, but basically get this, creation will be set free from its slavery, to, its slavery to corruption and into freedom of the glory of the children of God. For, amen. For we know that, all, that the whole of creation groans and suffers the birth, uh, pains of birth, childbirth, and t- uh, the, sorry, this is a different translation to what I'm used to, together until now. In other words, this is your greeny verse, okay? So, for everybody who wants to save the planet, this is it. Because when the sons of God manifest in their proper authority over the nations, then the earth will come into alignment and no longer bring forth thorns, brambles, famine, disease. It will come to an end because it's dwelling under the kingdom of our Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? I believe it. I believe it. The change in governance will change the earth. Adam's fall brought a curse to the earth. Adam was made out of the dust of the earth. He brought a curse to the earth. He was attached to the earth. But Jesus Christ broke that curse. But the manifestation of his sons and his kingdom come will actually annihilate it and take it out of its place. Because until now, we still haven't seen the full manifestation of the kingdom of God. We haven't. Why? Because Satan is still doing what he does. He's the prince of the air. So Jesus is returning. I believe it. Jesus' ministry when he came, he healed people. He set them free. We saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. There was so much that he did. He gave hope. He gave faith. He was love incarnate. That was his ministry. But his mission was to establish the kingdom of God. And once the kingdom is established, there will be no more sickness. There will be no more disease. There will be no more of those things. They will, they will all come to an end because the king is ruling. So how do I get beyond my horizon? i got to get there because there's a distance between where I'm going and where I am today. So there's got to be something that takes me there. There's got to be a gap that needs to be filled. And do I or can I do anything about that gap? You will find we're passing around some small things. These. Hey, Ashes, thank you so much for your help. While they're passing these around, let me just talk for a minute. Because God said something in his word. In fact, it was Jesus who said it. He said, do business until I come. So he gave us lots of parables, and they were all about the kingdom of God. The kingdom is like, the kingdom is like, the kingdom is like, the kingdom is like. So we can believe what Jesus said. So when he draws us a picture of the kingdom then we should be able to have that concept within our heart and within our mind and be able to step into that as well. So the kingdom is like, to one group of people, the master gave cities that they were in charge of. And as they multiplied their influence, he gave them more cities. Probably the one that is known mostly to us is the talents. To one, he gave five. To another, he gave two, and to another, he gave one. So what did they do? They each went away to do something. Now, the guy with one, he was an interesting character because what he did was he kept it safe and sound. That's all he did with it, is he kept it safe and sound. 
Do you really think the master gave it to him to keep it safe and sound? No, not at all. So the guy who had five, he worked on those, and he ended up with ten. The guy with two doubled his as well. When the master gives us something, there is an expectation that we will do something with it. He has an expectation because when the master returned, they had to give an account for what they'd done with what they'd been given. So there's an expectation. Have I, with my hope, got an expectation? Does my hope contain expectation? Do I expect something to happen or is my hope just hot air. I have an expectation. I really do. I have an expectation. But there's part of it that I've got to do. There's a part that I have to play. I can't expect this to turn into a forest unless I plant it. I've got to do something with it. So, here we go. Let me find this verse. 1 Corinthians 9, 11. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. So who supplied my seed? Who multiplied my seed? Okay, we have the vision. Who supplied the seed? God. Who multiplied the seed? No, God's a multiplier. That's the miracle. The miracle is how it multiplies. So who's the sower? We are the sower. You look at all the parables that Jesus talked about sowing seed. Seed is given. We're the sowers. And the multiplication comes from God. I got to do something with what I've been given. And if I do something, if I plant it, these are huge, aren't they? They are so the coolest. They come from down south. They have a story attached to them, but I digress. If I plant this, I should expect a forest. Now tell me, how stupid would it be for me to pop that down here and not plant it and expect a forest? But how often is our hope that thin or that stupid or that dumb? We have hope, but we don't do anything about our hope. So question, what is your hope based in? Because if it's based in an anchor that's beyond what you can see now, then it will surely come to pass. But you still have something to do to go the distance. I can't just sit on my hands. I've got to go somewhere. Mark 4, verse 30. And he said, How shall we picture the kingdom of God? Or by what parable shall we present it? It is like a mustard seed, which when it is sown upon the soil, though it is smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil, yet when it is sown, when it is sown, it grows up and it becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches. I, I get the seed from God, I plant the seed, it grows and becomes larger. But it's the next verse I want you to have a quick look at. So that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. If you look in the book of Revelation... You will see, I think it's chapter 18, that the demonic and the birds of the air are all tied together. So that when the scriptures are speaking about the birds of the air, they're talking about enemy forces. That which is without, that which occupies the air. Satan is also known as the prince of the air. And so the birds of the air are part of his consort. Got that? Yep. Right. Because he has dominion over the air, and these are the birds of the air. When we take what seems so small and so insignificant, and we plant it and God multiplies it, it will grow into something great, to a point that its greatness will then become the influencer. Its greatness 
will then become the thing that dictates where the birds of the air are. And in actual fact, the birds of the air will come underneath its shadow. And it will become the dominant governance authority over the enemy. Secular society is influenced by the enemy. Make no two ways about it. We look at it and we wonder how they can be so dumb. And the reason is, is because we can see what's beyond the horizon. We know what the Word of God says. And we go, well, how can you buy into that? Because it doesn't make sense. How can you buy? Uh, how often this argument and this argument are totally opposed to each other, but they uphold both. It's just crazy. And we look at it and we think, how can they? Because it's called deception. Who is the deceiver? The prince of the air. Who has got their ear? The air. But there'll come a time, there has to, because Christ is returning for his kingdom. When he returns for his kingdom, there's a governance. Kingdom and governance go hand in hand. So when we grow into everything, into the maturity that's seen in Hebrews 6, 1 to 3, there's a governance where the birds of the air are underneath or under the authority of the kingdom of God. What a day that will be. The tree begins to be the influencer. The tree begins to be, you know, the thing that's on the horizon that is bigger in the landscape than anything else. Krista preached about um, the seven pillars of society a couple of weeks ago. And if you didn't hear it, please, please get a hold of it because it talks about the seven pillars of society and how we can actually begin to affect those. Will it happen in five minutes? No, it's not instant, but we can grow. We can grow it. Do you know part of the vision for our school, not part, probably even the most important part, of the vision for our school is that the children that came through our school would be so confident in who they are in God, the purposes of God and the faith that's instilled in them, that anything was possible, that anything was possible, that God had empowered them with seed that would grow and multiply so that they wouldn't just be a success for themselves, but they would be a success for our nation, that they would become the influencer I am full of the power of the Holy Spirit. I am confident in my identity, purpose, and influence. You know, it is just to become a kingdom builder, a world changer, a dominion taker. Those words aren't empty. They're a belief system. They're a belief system that if we take something small and we take care of it and plant it and nurture it, it will grow. But when it does grow to its full height, it's full maturity. Not only will it be a pretty tree, not only will it be a fruitful tree, but it'll actually be a dominant governmental authority tree that has more going for it, more clout. See, we don't, trees don't eat their own fruit. Other people do. But this tree that Jesus spoke about, it wasn't just fruitful, it was actually dominant. It became the dominion taker and the world changer and the influencer. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, the one which enters in beyond the veil. Matthew 16, I also say to you, Peter, that upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell aren't going to prevail against it. I'm not going to overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things unseen. Turn to your neighbor and say, my heart is full of hope.
and turn to your other neighbor, I know there's more. Father, I thank you. I thank you that you are...